society, big piece of Tourette for many people, definitely for both my kids. Uh, a lot of times it looks like refusal and re rigidity, right? You're refusing to engage in behavior, refusing to go to school, uh, you have an angry response, the difficulty with transitions, going from place to place. Uh, we can do deliberate social teaching for our children of what a typical or a more normal response from a child would look like. And we can ask them to do that. They might be mad at us, you know, like, <laughs> hello, it's not acceptable for you to say to me, I don't care, <laughs> you know, when I say it's time to leave. You may say, okay, mom, that's a typical response. And now you may say it. Well, then she's like, <laughs> You know, and I say, you may say, okay, mom, because I want to know that deep in your heart, you're speaking to me like you're feeling in your heart, because I know you're not a mean person, and I know you're not a jerk, and so you're going to use the words that I know are the right words in your heart, so you can say, okay, mom, you know, or we can, you know, model the kinds of social interactions that we want to have with our children. And they're going to talk back, they're going to blur out embarrassing things, but they don't, they might be like saying it, but we can also teach them these really deliberate social teaching. Um, I work with my kids on breath work. Uh, we just do, you know, I show them that, so let's all do this. If you take your notebooks and put them down for a minute, put your hands on your lower belly. This is what we talk about like in yoga. That, um, like at Caltech, they talk about how our serotonin is made in our digestive tract in 90% of it or so. Uh, you put your hands on your lower belly, and when you breathe in through your nose, you make your belly up like a balloon. So that actually, that type of breathing is relaxing and it supports our digestive health and the other issues that are happening in our digestion, which serotonin creation, things like that, we like to think that that helps with that. Um, in our yoga teaching, you know, they teach us that this kind of deep breath, up here, a chest breath is like an adrenaline breath. So we can teach our kids when they need to calm down, do your balloon belly breaths, okay? Let's do them together. Um, art therapies, you know, we do the adding to the story thing and the throwing away for the anxiety. Uh, we use visualization and intention, teach the kids to think about themselves actually succeeding at what it is that they want to do. When they feel nervous, like they're not going to succeed at something, actually have a picture in their mind of themselves succeeding in that way. Um, you might consider whether to look for dietary triggers. I know for my own particular children, there are some food additives that uh, seem to be related to increased anxiety and increased um, ticking. In the, uh, in the U.S., there's a lot of food additives, and we don't have as much of that here. A lot of artificial coloring we have, artificial sweeteners, hidden in many ingredients. So we've become a family that uses ingredient labels, and um, because we've seen a pattern of those things being related to increased anxiety. So for some families, that's not a road that they want to go down, but for us, it's definitely not an important component. Um, hyperactivity or ADHD. Um, I think that exercise and purposeful work is like a medicine. Um, in, the, in the Native American tribes, they talk about um, like things in our lives as being our medicines, right? Our medicines are things that keep us well and healthy, spiritually, physically. Um, we, you know, Willow talks about swimming as her medicine, and we talk about like how if we're not getting the exercise and the leisure and the, um, and the purposeful work that um, that we're not doing our medicine. So if you, you know, if you come from a family who uses medicine to support Tourette, you know how important that medicine is for your child's functioning, right? Um, and, it, and if you are a person who suffers from migraines, you know how important having that medicine available to you is in the support of the library health. Well, that's how we think of all of these things that we do for our kids. Those are like our medicine. And if we don't take the time every day to make sure that our kids have the opportunity for exercise, and then they have increased symptoms and we're frustrated with them, well, we forgot to give them the medicine, right? Um, our kids are really <coughs> time musicians. Um, playing an instrument uses a lot of body, brain, you know, uh, regions and zones. And um, we think of that as like a physical therapy for our kids. I teach my children, too, that not all hyperactivity is bad. Okay? So hyperactivity also means that you're hyper alert, which can actually be really helpful in some careers, helpful in some types of lives. 
Um, there are a lot of creative people, a lot of good athletes and musicians, my own children too, um, and they have Tourette and ADHD. So I say, uh, you know, see how it benefits you too. Don't just look at all that stuff. Um, with impulsivity uh, for ADHD, impulsivity would mean like to act without thinking. I'm sure you probably know about that. But I say um, it's important to look for patterns in that because you might find that some of those really risky behaviors that your children are engaging in, whether it's like rages or continued attacks on the same person, a lot of those things have patterns. Um, so to protect your own safety and your child's safety, you're going to want to look at your environment and see what kinds of things you can set up. Um, some of these children might really benefit from having a one-to-one aid at school. You make sure that you have a one-to-one -one child adult ratio when you go out places. Um, something you can do to improve that, especially with the young children, is to um, model and to spend floors on the them. So that's where you would want to spend, you know, like an hour a day on the floor with them doing their choice of activity uh, for play, and then in that time you're modeling like eye contact and social skills, imagine the play. Um, when you find that you're having, you know, risky behavior patterns, you can kind of like choose each one, like maybe your child has several risky behavior patterns or dangerous things that they do that are upsetting to you. Um, I would encourage you to choose one at a time and work to extinct that behavior. Um, you can, you know, like Sue talks about doing a behavioral assessment on your own children. Uh, they do them in schools, but you can kind of do your own like family version of that, where you're watching, choosing which behaviors are the worst at the time, um, deciding to institute a positive behavior plan, right? Where you maybe do a chart that says like each chunk of the day, uh, between breakfast and morning snack, between morning snack and lunch. If you get through each section, you get a little check mark in your box, you know, without doing that behavior. And if you get to the end of the day and you've received, you know, whatever you determine is the amount, maybe at first it's only half to try to get them there without doing that behavior towards someone else's body or something like that, then, um, then they get maybe five extra minutes to stay up late and play a game with just you or something like that. Uh, we did, we've done a million of these over the years with our kids during the times that they need them. The rest of the time, they didn't need them. But when we saw a repeat dangerous behavior or something like that coming up, um, those became really important to us as a family. Uh, social stories. Uh, those are used a lot with children with autism spectrum disorders. But um, so social stories are things that you create for your child uh, before you go to a new event or a new type of location. You can say, uh, tell them a little story about them there at that location. Okay, so let's say you have to go to a funeral and you're like, okay, so I'm going to tell you a story today about when Willow went to Grandma's funeral. When Willow went to Grandma's funeral, Willow walked in the back doors of the church uh, and sat down quietly with mom and dad and brother and sister. And then um, when she needed to go to the bathroom, she only whispered very quietly to her mom and tugged on her arm gently and snuck around at the back. And then Willow was very quiet during the funeral. And at the end of the funeral, all of the children in the family stood up to hug each other and to take a picture of the family together outside of the church. And then it was okay for Willow to talk at the end of the day. Okay? So stories like that with little children or before maybe if they're having a surgery or a doctor's appointment or a trip to the bowling alley or the movie theater. Basically, you are like fluffing up the expectations, right? The expectations are these types of behaviors, but you're telling it to them in a story way. And if you get into that area and they're not really doing what you expected, you can say, oh, remember in that story how, um, the, you know, how the story said that this was a time where um, you know what we were going to say? I can't tell you how great those were for, for my own children over the years. It got to where we just kind of did it automatically in the car. I'm like, oh, geez, we forgot to do a story. You know? When we were going to this movie theater for the first time, we just dressed up. And they're just very simple that way. Um, as far as sensory goes, you know, it's being sensitive. I can't recommend enough finding an occupational therapist that can help you come up with. Uh, sensory treatments for your child, and those are issues for them. Um, a sensory diet doesn't mean what you're eating. That means like some things that you choose to do every day that benefit the way that they're feeling. Uh, for some examples are like um, like if a child is like sensitive to you know sound when you go places and they plug their ears and scream, uh, you might want to consider having a set of earplugs in your pocket when you go somewhere. 
um, and, and talk with them about like how, hey, you know, it seems like I'm seeing this kind of thing. Um, maybe you feel uncomfortable when we go there. Maybe you'd like us to make sure we have your plugs. Um, we found that um, for Willow, it was really beneficial for her to have her sensory diet every day at school before she started school. She'd go to the OT room, do five minutes of her exercises that the OT had determined were beneficial for her own sensory needs. A couple hours would go by, she'd go back and do it again. A couple of hours would go by, she'd go back and do it again. And man, when she did that, she was on the ball in school. She was on the ball in class and really able to uh, keep it together more than the days when she didn't have OT. Um, and you can do those things with your kids at home. Some people do brushing, trampolining, chair push-ups. Um, and again, the social stories. Uh, we like to run our kids back, so that's a really soothing, you know, deep kind of muscle, they like that. Um, as far as low frustration tolerance goes, some of our children can be easy to anger at times, especially when your tics or anxiety is kind of up. Um, and there are some issues with rage. Our family chooses to use nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. We think he's a pretty cool uh, guy. He's got a good way of talking. It's just basically like you acknowledge people's needs and how the needs express themselves in behaviors. So if a person is doing something that um, it's maybe like not a, not a, not a nice thing or not, not something that um, is beneficial to other people, you know, maybe they're harming people, you would, you would maybe say, like, are you doing this because of this? Or are we trying to like look for the need that the person's trying to express through their anger or behavior? Uh, one example might be like a, a toddler who wants to still nurse, you know, and, and you're like, I have to do the dishes right now. And so she might like, bite ya. You know, grab your arm and just burn it, you know, and I'm like, oh, are you biting me because you want to nurse right now? Well, and then, yeah, you know, it's like, well, guess what? That's great, you know, that you want to nurse right now, but I have this one thing that I have to do first. I, I understand you have a need, you know, and I have a need too, and my need right now is this, and you can work it all, you know, you can work it all out. Well, it works, um, it, it, you know, it's nice in the sense that it validates the people's needs and maybe where their expressions are coming from. So that's called NBC, it's not a communication. And that's not to say that all of our communication is perfect, but it's not. Um, <laughs> other just general health and wellness things that we do with our family. Um, we do counseling for the children at school and also finally outside of school. Um, more so when their kids are ramping up again and when their uh, anxiety issues are ramping up. We go to the counselor more frequently during those times and we go less frequently during those times that we uh, We tend to go to a chiropractor a couple times a year. Uh, my kids had some sleep issues that we had to get taken care of. They kind of developed an apnea and they weren't sleeping well at night. The pediatrician had recommended, uh, well, before you know, looking at an SSR for depression, let's assess their sleep and see if they're oxygenated at night. You know, and then they weren't. And he said, okay, well, go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor and kind of work it out with them. So those types of things um, can help. We saw that certainly with my son. Um, massage can really help a lot of people. Um, Stress with general health and wellness, and then we eat really nutrient rich foods and drink plenty of water. Um, I think it's important to support aspects which improve our quality of life, too. And remember that our kids are not uh, clinical cases, they're our little sweet people, and they need quality of life, too. Um, we have to support their hobbies, and if they're dangerous hobbies, or violent hobbies, or hobbies that could be harmful to them, how can we kind of gear them towards? A safer version of that. Um, some kids with OCD will get really obsessed with guns. <laughs> you know? And how do we um, support their interests without having it just become something that's going to be really dangerous for them? Um, making time for quality rest and routine, of course. Uh, it's easier said than done, but it's really beneficial when we're doing it. You know? Maybe during the holidays, that's a little harder. And then just helping kids find their niche. What are they good at? What do they enjoy doing? And make time in your family to be a part of that and to have that be a regular part of your life. You know, we're developing as people. We want to help them develop as people. Not just little treasures, right? Um, and lastly, I'd like to say that in our family, we found some very things are helpful, like I mentioned earlier. And I know there are some people uh, who anecdotally mentioned that they also have found some relief by removing some chemical additives from their food uh, that they eat. Um, like I said, we found it helpful to 
the way artificial colors, which I think are called E numbers here. Um, artificial sweeteners uh, aren't so good for my kids. Um, my son's hyperactivity gets off chart when he has added nitrates in his food, and then also um, when he has MSG, he, his anxiety is, is more off the charts. It's very high. So um, each for each child, I think it's probably going to be different, you know. And we find that we um, also benefit from just a standard multivitamin and some probiotics just uh, to support our general health, which then overlaps into um, relief from our Tourette because our general health is as good as we hope it can be. Um, and then lastly, I would say um, biomedical support, um, and that kind of leads into some of the the diet, body, cellular uh, health issues that some people appreciate. Um, there's not a lot of research about biomedical support. If you're interested, you can move into Oxford University or some of the other places where you do training for that. And then, um, you know, that's sort of like the raw health um, type of assessment. And um, speaking of raw health, Molly Logan uh, Isan has a couple of resources to share with you. Um, if you're interested, you can take those home with you.